This is the second of the series that I said I would show. This relates more closely to my actual field. We're talking about COVID-19's economy and what will happen after it's over. You hear people saying we're in a recession, you hear people saying we're in a depression, you hear people denying that we're in a depression, and it really is simply a, fa a fact of life that while we're not technically officially in a recession yet, or a depression, and won't be until the second quarter economic report comes in, we are in a depression. A recession of any type is two consecutive quarters, so first quarter, second quarter, second quarter, third quarter, whatever two quarters, where the gross domestic product for a country falls. Recession can be shallow or deep. Recessions can be national or international. Recessions tend to last no more than a year or two at most, and usually a few months. Now, you can argue that a depression is a particularly deep recession, but the reality is that it's more than that. The GDP falls much faster, much further in a depression than in a recession. GDP must fall more than 10%, and recovery is slower usually taking years. Now, we know that our GDP has been dropping steadily since the beginning of the COVID economy. GDP dropped 5% in the first quarter. We don't know the second quarter figures yet, which is why people can say, well, we're not in a recession or a depression yet, but from what we do know, experts in the government can project the second quarter economy, which is projected to drop 40%. Now, those figures won't be out until August, so it is a legitimate quibble that the economy is not a recession or a depression. But in fact, the economy is in a depression. With a drop of 45% of GDP, we have almost cut our productivity in half. And analysts are hoping, hoping, not guaranteeing, and they're basically hoping based on trends they think they see in other countries, that we will recover about 21% in the third quarter. Now, if we recover 21% in the third quarter, we will be recovering 21% of the 55% of the economy that we started out with. We will not be recovering 21% of the entire economy that we started out with, but only 21% roughly of what's left of that economy when we enter the third quarter. Now, officially, unemployment stands somewhere between 13 and 14%. On the right, you see the unemployment rates chart issued by the United States Department of Labor. However, the U.S. Department of Labor has now admitted that they misclassified 8 million workers at the time this was taken. They classified 8 million workers who had been laid off as working. It's a little more complicated than that, but that's what it comes down to. At the same time, Irregular workers were not classified as unemployed, even though they were. Now, there would be all sorts of people that are, un that are irregular workers, including people that if you own a business and you drive down to a, a daily place where you can hire laborers for the day, those are irregular workers. So what is the actual rate of unemployment? It's not clear certainly 18 percent. It could be 20 percent, and there are economists who think it's as high as 27 percent. I don't think it's that high, but it is higher than the 14.7 or whatever that you're seeing touted officially. So more than a 10 percent cut in productivity. An unemployment rate coming close to rivaling the final and worst unemployment 
in the Great Depression, which was 24.9%, we are realistically in a depression. Now, recovery from a recession or a depression occurs when GDP is back to the point it was before the fall. So we need to regain that entire 45% of our GDP that we lost before we're considered to be out of this recession slash depression. Recoveries occur in two forms, V-shaped and U-shaped. V-shaped productivity comes down, productivity goes back up, just like a V. U-shaped productivity drops, levels out, and goes back after time. U-shaped recessions last longer. Depressions tend to be U-shaped. There is hope that in this case it will be V-shaped. But that's tricky as well because quite often recoveries are V-shaped for the stock market. They're V-shaped for investors, but they're U-shaped for the people. The 2007-2008 recession was V-shaped for the markets, U-shaped for the people. We don't know whether this is going to be the same or not. We hope not, but we do not know. But there are long-term effects to what has happened. And I want to spend some time looking at them and at things we may need to do. Now, those of you who have watched my videos before, who have heard me lecture, know that I believe, and in fact, most people in my field believe, that Schumpeter's Gale is failing, that the technologies that are emerging now are so advanced that they replace labor without creating new jobs, or as many new jobs as they destroy. Sean Peter's Gale is an old economic law that says that new technologies emerge, those technologies destroy jobs and create jobs. The new jobs they create are better than the old jobs they destroyed. We have not seen that in decades. Gig jobs were one of the big drivers of the economic recovery. The weakness that gig jobs have, have has been revealed in this crisis. Gig jobs are jobs where you Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, etc., etc. These are gig jobs. There's no job security at all. No one thinks there is. Um, but they're the only thing a lot of people can get and have been able to get for 20 years. It is literally 20 years. Now, these are technologically driven jobs. You cannot do a gig job without technology. They're technologically driven jobs globally. The companies that push them make enormous amounts of money. We can talk about that at another time. This, I want to discuss things that matter to all of us in this video. If you like my videos, follow and subscribe. I think I'm supposed to say that, right? Subscribe to this channel because there will be more and I will go in more deeply to the various economic issues in some of those. Gig jobs collapsed. It was not a week after the crisis started, before you started seeing an enormous erosion of gig jobs. People who had been able to make a living, people I know, actually, who had been able to make a living, suddenly couldn't. Period. The jobs were just gone because people weren't taking Uber, people weren't taking Lyft, people weren't getting DoorDash, or not as often. People, which then brings you to the instability of service sector jobs. The majority of full-time jobs that have been created since I was a lot younger than this, let me tell you, were created in the service sector. Whether it was retail jobs selling things to people, whether it was restaurant jobs, whether it service sector jobs, millions and millions and millions, and they collapsed almost as quickly as gig jobs, despite an effort to prop them up. If you work for a restaurant, nobody can come in the restaurant, you're laid off. 
but there are other long-term effects that this has had on our political economy. For one thing, for more than a decade now, closer to 20 years, corporations have been struggling. Well, you know, how many jobs can we have people do remotely? How many jobs can people do from home for us? How many of our workers actually need to come into the office? Now, obviously, this does not affect big manufacturing, but big manufacturing is a smaller and smaller percentage, not only of our jobs, but of global jobs, because so many are being replaced with robots, whether it's here or in China. So the struggle has been that senior executives were afraid to let people work from home. They were afraid that somehow they would lose value, lose productivity. So in many cases, they kept the people coming to their offices. This is proof of concept. Yes, productivity declined a little, but it, a lot. But per person, productivity declined a little, but not because of working from home. The overwhelming majority of office jobs can be performed from a home office with no problem whatsoever, and corporations now have that proof. I do not think that a significant number of the jobs that return after the crisis is over are going to go back to office spaces. I think a lot of them are going to be worked from home, which is not a bad thing. But the second part of that is they have also been able to see people they don't need to bring back because of the technology, because of the present paradigm. And if you work in an office environment, you've been watching this for years. I watched the number of clerical staff. I've worked for the same institution for almost 30 years. And in that time, I watched the number of clerical staff decline gradually. Everybody now has a computer, a good computer on their desk. Everybody can do work that a clerical did 15 years ago, 20 years ago. 25 years ago. That is a significant effect on the workforce. Some people are probably not going to get what were stable jobs back because that is the other thing the corporate bosses can see in addition to proof of concept that working from home works is maybe we need less workers. At the same time, we have seen money continue to migrate upward to the richest percent, half percent, less than that perhaps, at the same time that there is a crisis going on that is denying millions of people the ability to eat. This clearly demonstrates the level of control that the elite have. It is something that we need to think about. And our next fiscal crisis is going to be commercial office space, I guarantee you. What can you do? It's a real quandary. One thing you need to do is pay off your debt and not acquire new debt. Then you need to diversify your income streams if you can. Many people can't. And what do I mean by diversify your income streams? I mean find some other things, whether gig or other, on the side that you're qualified to do, that you can do that at least brings in a little extra money. Once you have that, if you can get that, try to save a few months survival money. The reality is, we have seen repeatedly in studies, most Americans cannot survive three months without their paycheck. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, work for a change in the economic system that stresses all people. That sounds counterintuitive, I know. But this political economy is ending. COVID simply 
demonstrated its weaknesses and gave proof of concept to corporations, it does not change the fact that Americans, by and large, the world's citizens, by and large, need a new economic system that stresses something besides productivity in traditional jobs as a method of people surviving. Because the reality is that we do not need the number of traditional workers we have. One thing you can do is education. There is a push right now to push more people toward the trades. I was the assistant to the dean at the Van Arsdale School of Labor Studies in Manhattan for years. There aren't enough jobs in the trades to make a difference. You go into the apprenticeship program. If you're in a major city, you probably have your union send you for real education, training, engineering, etc. And you have a job with stability and security to a large degree. It doesn't cover most people. If huge numbers of people go into the trades, it provides downward pressure on wages and upward competition for existing jobs. It is pie in the sky. Yes, we need people in the trades. We need the same number of 100,000 that we've needed for decades. We have millions, more than millions of people. So we need to have you, all of you, look for new ways to make the economy better post-COVID for yourselves and for all other people. There needs to be change. I'm not going into depth here. I will go into depth in other videos in the future. But that is basic material that I think we all need to consider.